Hi, my name is Matthew Pose, and in this video I'm going to be talking about some basic concepts of soundproofing so that as I go through the soundproofing efforts in my theater, everybody can kind of follow along and feel like they understand what I'm doing. But also, really my goal is to help educate people so that they can feel like they better understand the things that they're being told when they're trying to buy products and get advice and how to soundproof their own room. So. Um, one of the things that uh, I get a lot when I talk to clients, for instance, or to be honest, I was talking to my brother about this and he was mentioning he could hear he, he had taken some extra efforts in his new house to make it so that the floor was isolated and not soundproof maybe, but more sound resistant than uh, a normal floor would be because he didn't want to hear the kids. And he had mentioned to me something about doing this, but he kind of said, like, I don't really want like a console. I'm just, I'm going to do this. Is it going to work? And I remember saying to him something like, well, it's, it'll be okay. And he, basically what he did was cork. Um, so it's really common that when we're trying to build a space, we'll try to stick with the most basic approach to sound isolation that we can in order to keep costs down. And in many cases, it's not a material cost issue. The labor costs get up so high and the overall project is already so expensive. You know, you're putting new floors in or whatever that you just don't want to go crazy with the sound isolation. But unfortunately, a lot of those efforts are uh, largely misplaced. They just don't work that well. So forgetting what the manufacturers claim and the made up IAC numbers that they tend to produce. IAC is the um, impact insulation class. So it's basically like the, the ability of the floor to isolate against impact from footsteps and pounding. Um, and then there's STC, that's airborne noise, able to go down through the floor or through walls. The efforts we typically take rely on kind of artificial decoupling that doesn't work that well. Cork is a great example of that foam. Any of those materials that are used on floors that are trying to create some sort of a decoupled springy air gap, if you will, uh, between the floor and, and below um, to reduce sound and footfall. And it, it works a little bit. It's actually a good idea to do it in addition to other things. But for the most part, it offers very little benefit on its own. And in walls, what you tend to see people do is they add like an extra layer of uh, drywall and maybe some insulation. And actually the worst thing I see, what I think people need to kind of learn um, not to do, is they pack those walls thick with like mineral wool insulation. I think there's this view that, you know, that because the mineral wool has a little bit of a better absorption coefficient than typical fluffy fiberglass does, that in a wall it's gonna create more sound isolation and it's heavy, right? And, I think what you hear so much is mass is the most important thing in sound isolation and therefore you're making the wall more massive, you're going to get better sound isolation. But when people pack those walls so thick that it's actually touching the drywall on both sides, then what you've actually done is created a kind of short circuit where there's now a mass path. So there's something with mass to it that is connecting two sides. So the studs do that, but the studs are every 16 inches. Now you've made it so that there's just a solid mass all the way across. And so now sound energy can go right through. And so what you tend to see on walls that are done that way when they're packed so tightly is a negative uh, STC improvement. In other words, you get, the wall becomes worse than it would be had you done nothing at all. And so that's not a good idea. And I, and I unfortunately have seen that in quite a few theaters. What you really want to do is actually a fairly light insulation and ideally you would have it kind of more on one side than another. So you don't really want even light fluffy insulation touching the drywall on both sides. There, ideally it won't be touching on one side because you just don't, you want to avoid any chance of there being any kind of mass bridge created between the two sides like that. Now that brings up the other issue, which is that you've got the way that sound transfers through structures like walls and floors. So the way I think we often think about it is you've got this vibrational energy from sound and it hits the wall and it travels through the wall because it's able to push through the wall because the wall is so lightweight. But it's not really what happens. Actually, the sound energy uh, hits, hits the wall and the wall essentially absorbs that sound energy and then doesn't like dissipate it though. I mean, a little tiny bit of it gets dissipated, but it vibrates to it and it retransfers the energy on the other side of the wall. So you've got that drywall, you've got a core, it's hollow, so it just kind of goes right through and then it hits the next drywall, it does the same thing. But there's an issue here, which is that where there's no studs, when there's just drywall, the, in, it, what's called acoustical, acoustical impedance is pretty different between air and drywall. 
So a good amount of that energy actually reflects each time it has to go through a structure like that. So if there were no studs in walls, you'd actually probably gain about six STC points. It would be that much better. Which tells you something, because studs are heavy. You know, the, the two by four studs themselves are heavy and yet they're making things worse. Why? Because the primary, primary mechanism in which sound transfers through walls is actually the radiation of those vibrational energies through the studs themselves. So it's hitting the drywall. The drywall is acting almost like a microphone diaphragm. I shouldn't say almost, it is acting like a microphone diaphragm. And then it transfers it through that stud. That stud is like, if you think about the old cup telephone game, so the walls are the cups, the wall panels, the drywall itself, the studs is the string. Goes through that stud, hits the other one, and radiates out on the other side. And because the acoustical impedance of a wood stud and drywall are actually pretty similar, there's a pretty efficient transfer of energy between those. So that's why the walls themselves are not so great, and why the best way you can provide sound isolation in a room is through decoupling. So if you can break the link between those layers of drywall and the studs, you can create a, a, enough of a difference in the acoustical impedances that as it tries to go through, it's gonna hit something so different than instead of going through, it's gonna to wanna to do something else. So one of the things it could do in the case of something like a silicone isolator is the silicone will actually dissipate a lot of that energy as heat, or it'll bounce back. So in the case of something like a uh, concrete wall, <laughs> A lot of it just bounces back. But like I said, in the case of these springy decoupled walls, a lot of it is dissipated as heat in that, in that process when it hits it. And one of the things that makes that process more efficient is insulation. So as long as you're not creating a, a bridge, as I said, and it's just there in the air gap, then as the sound energy starts to try to radiate out in a shearing direction, so instead of going straight through, which is the problem direction, it'll, because of the change in acoustical impedance caused by this decoupling, instead of going straight through, it starts to go to the sides. And then one of the great things about that is it's a very inefficient way for it to travel. And so it dissipates its heat very quickly. And so because of that, you've got the energy just going through the sides of the, kind of sideways through the wall. You've got insulation in there and the combined process of basically going sideways through the wall material, sideways through the open gap that now has insulation in it, et cetera, is that very little of it gets through to the other side. And so that's why decoupling tends to create this rise in STC on the wall that's much more substantial than if you just made it more massive. So decoupling is number one. M mass matters too. So we'll say mass is like the next most important thing. You know, you don't want to focus on that as the primary thing because you're going to probably see more benefit from the decoupling, but you, you got to do both. And so mass is things like adding more drywall, using heavier materials. A uh, hardy board is a good example. It's a cement board. It's actually heavier than drywall. So that tends to work a little bit better. Uh, concrete blocks. I mean, you, you don't have to make a stud wall. You can make concrete blocks, but just know you can't build a normal house and then put concrete walls up. You got to plan for that ahead of time. But they're really good at it in terms of keeping sound out. There's problems with them though, which is that they're very rigid. So they tend to keep a lot of sound in even at low frequencies, which tends to cause a lot of problems with base modes, but that's a side issue. So mass is important. That's the next thing you want to focus on. But then there's another issue, which is that the way that the wall isolates is going to be frequency dependent. So there's a mass controlled zone, and that's going to fall between the resonant frequency of the structure, the coincident frequency, and the resonant frequency of the material itself. Those are kind of like an upper and a lower bound. In between that zone, mass tends to dominate quite a bit. I mean, this decoupling is still important in that region. It's still more important, but mass tends to be the thing that blocks the most sound. So that's where adding a layer of drywall helps. At the resonant frequency itself of the structure, for instance, and at that upper one that I mentioned, mass doesn't matter. Stiffness only affects the frequency. Actually, mass and stiffness together are gonna to affect the frequency, I should say. And the depth of the wall cavity affects that lower bound frequency. So making that bigger lowers the frequency, increases the mass controlled zone, which is helpful. At that frequency though, which is itself pretty wide, it's not a narrow Q, the only thing that really matters is damping. So damping is gonna be best helped by uh, something like green glue, some sort of a, a damping product that you add. And the most efficient tends to be, I mean, you really need a, an efficient damping process here. So the most efficient tends to be constrained layer damping. That's what you should be doing there. 
So that really helps there. It helps with the upper end, it tends to extend the mass controlled zone as well, kind of flattens out that, that curve so you don't see a big dip at both ends. Below that frequency though, mass doesn't matter anymore. Damping doesn't matter anymore. Only thing that matters is stiffness. And this is where people seem to get it wrong. I've heard a lot of people say at low frequencies, in order to really contain those or keep them out, whatever you're trying to do, you want a really high mass floppy structure. And that's not true. There's a certain point at which there's nothing you can do. You're going to hit a resonant frequency and you just need to not rely on mass anymore. And to be honest, mass is pretty inefficient at controlling low frequencies. So what you want to do is rely on the fact that this is going to become a pressure vessel, the, the walls, the room itself, and that it is the stiffness of the wall that will contain those low frequencies. So once you're below that frequency, you really just need a stiff structure. And so that's why there's advantages to building walls in a particular way where the intent is to potentially contain and damp that energy. So the way I do it is you've got an inner and an outer shell. So the inner shell is your decoupled wall. You want that one to be well damped. You want it to move. And then you've got an outer shell. In my case, I prefer that outer shell to be as stiff as possible. And then in the in-between, you've got insulation and you've got a structure where between the damped movable front part of it, which is the inner shell and the insulation, you've got essentially a really good base trap for absorbing a ton of that low frequency energy that's going to be bouncing back. But the way I'm going to contain it from getting out is that stiff outer structure, which I do by not decoupling, by actually making it as stiff as possible. So you might dampen it still, there might be value in that, but that's not my main focus. It's just trying to put multiple layers of material together. Um, Cinder blocks are really good. You know, having an outer shell that's extra stiff because you're using concrete probably is the best way to contain the low frequencies. And the reason is not because it's massive, it's actually because it's so stiff. It's much, much stiffer than a drywall structure. So that really explains the, uh, the role that damping mass, decoupling, uh, and stiffness play in soundproofing and helps you to kind of understand why we design the walls in different ways depending on what we're trying to do. Now, I think a lot of this is a little bit theoretical right now. So you're going to see this will all make like way more sense when you start to actually see the wall design. And I'm going to start to actually draw those up so you can see what it looks like to get a good sense of this. And I think that will help you all if you plan to do something similar. All right. Well, I hope you found the video interesting and I got more of these planned. Uh, there's going to be trying to do as many of these as I can uh, to keep people interested and in seeing what's going on. The building process will take a while. So I'll see you next time.